Good morning. How are y'all? I promised Graham that I would stand in one spot so he could get a shot of me. How do, oh, I look good. <laughs> good day, mate. As Rob said, I'm Patrick Briggs, and I have the privilege of being the avid Texas State Assistant Director. So my job with my team, hey! Oh, wait a minute. The Texans are here. Let's, let's make sure. Wait a minute, Texans. We got to represent. I'm going to make sure. You got to finish this phrase, Texans. The stars at night shine big and bright. Ha! Ha! So with my team, I have the privilege of supporting the 900 sites in the state of Texas. As you can see, we're here at the AVID National Conference where our theme is college and career ready students, a pledge to the future. A pledge to the future. Now look at that, look at that teacher up there. Look at those students up there. Well, they are just smiling and grinning. Look at those babies. They have their hands in the air. They're ready to participate. Look at that teacher. has this big old grin on his face ready to participate, ready to teach babies. I want you to know, as a first-year teacher, I'm going to be open, honest, and vulnerable with you. As a first-year teacher, that wasn't me. <laughs> oh, it was me on the first day and the last. <laughs> but the 178 days in between, that wasn't me. How did I get there? There was a time, I'm just going to be open, honest, and vulnerable with you. See, I walked into my classroom the first day at 21 years old, and I thought I knew it all. You couldn't tell me anything. I told those children they were privileged to have me. Because, see, I had a college degree from Prairie View A&M University. Oh, are there some Panthers in the house? Where are my Panthers? I, okay. All right. I, I see you over there, sister. All right. I had a college degree from Prairie View A&M University, and I had a teaching certificate that expired at life. It expired when I did. <laughs> How many of you have a life teaching certificate? See, some of y'all didn't know those existed. My principal certificate is life. So you couldn't tell me anything. So I walked into a room full of 12-year-old people and I said, let's go. And I defaulted to my learning style. See, I thought all kids were like me, on track to go to college, on track to go to a HBCU like Prairie View a and &M. Did I tell y'all I went to Prairie View? <laughs> You'll hear it again. So I gave my kids notes. See, that's what my teachers did for me. But because I was a memorizer, I did well. I gave my kids notes, and I looked at those babies, and I said, put those notes away. Test Thursday. Study. Oh, that's loaded. Put those notes away, assume they had an organized system for doing so, because after all, they were 12. They should know that by now. See, my district paid me thousands of dollars a year to teach science. Put those notes away, test Thursday. Assume they had a calendaring system and a place to organize when assignments were, because after all, they're 12. They ought to know that by now. Put those notes away, test Thursday, study. Because after all, they knew how to study because they were 12. They should know that by now. So I gave my first test as a 21-year-old know-it-all teacher, and I looked at my students and I said, all of you will make a 100 on this first test because I made the test from the notes. I looked at a room full of 12-year-old people and I said, you'd have to be a moron 
not to make a 100 because I hand wrote my first test. I wasn't going to leave anything to chance, you see. <laughs> I said, ooh, that's in the notes, number one on the test. That's in the notes, number two on the test. First time I gave a test as a classroom teacher, <laughs> I stood in front of the room grinning, and the children said, Mr. Briggs, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I said, oh. I can't wait to grade your first test because all of you will make a 100. They said, we will? I said, yes, because I made the test from the notes. And I told you, put those notes away, test Thursday, study. <laughs> I got my first test back. Guess how many 100s I had? Zero. I even had kids fail that first test. So I walked into that room the next day with those tests and I looked at those children and I said, what's wrong with y'all? I'm a good teacher. College degree from Prairie View A&M University. Teaching certificate that expires at life. See, they don't just give those out. You people are the problem. Oh, so I got creative. I said, take out the test. Take out the notes. If you find anything in that test that is not in the notes, I'm going to give you $1,000. I was a first-year teacher. I didn't have $1,000. <laughs> oh, but see, I knew I didn't need it because I made the test from the notes. 20 minutes later, a room full of 12-year-old people looked at me and said, Mr. Briggs, Everything in the test is in the notes. So again, I looked at a room full of 12-year-old people and said, what's wrong with y'all? <laughs> what I had taught kids to do was copy. And they were good at it. Oh yes, I use science words and phrases to do it, but I was teaching, how do you copy from an overhead in Mr. Briggs's class? But I had the nerve to assess them in science. See, my instruction was how do you copy from an overhead with science words and phrases to do it? But my assessment was seventh grade science, and I was mad at children because they couldn't perform on a science assessment. I know you don't have those teachers, but I used to lecture for children, two children, for 45 minutes and send them to the next period. I know you don't have teachers like that, but I used to be one. So I had to become the pledge to the future. I had to say to myself, Patrick, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? If your children are not being successful, what is your part in that, Patrick? Because I would talk to teachers, and I had a teacher tell me, oh, my class is so rigorous. Half the kids fail my class. <laughs> and what I now realize is if half the kids failed your class, you didn't teach. Period, paragraph. That's my way of saying we're moving on. <laughs> if half the kids are not successful, I had to start looking in the mirror and saying, Patrick, what's wrong with you? And at that point, I became the pledge to the future. And see, I didn't understand about relationships. Now, you don't need to be able to read that screen because it just has a whole lot of documentation that says relationships matter. All of you in this auditorium have a child in your class or in your school that will do anything in the world for you. And that same child walks down the hall after a five minute passing period and acts a fool. Now let's be honest. Does the child change in a five minute passing period? No. What changes is the relationship with the significant adult in the room. All of you have, oh, oh, hey, all right. 
Because we have to talk about relational capacity. See, as a first-year teacher, I didn't believe I needed to have a relationship with children. That's not why I was there. And by Thanksgiving, there were two or three of them I hated. <laughs> and by Thanksgiving, there were two or three that hated me because of relational capacity. So that second year as a teacher, I said, I'm going to get to know my students because they don't care how much I know until they know how much I care. So I started bonding with children. Oh, and the teachers in the teacher's lounge laughed at me. <laughs> Patrick's down there bonding with children. <laughs> I'm on page 53. <laughs> Two weeks later, the kids were in my classroom. Mr. Briggs, we love you. We love your classroom. We wouldn't dare walk in here late. We will do anything in the world for you, but Mr. Briggs, we gonna learn any science this year? I said, let's go. Because at that point, I had them. And I was teaching 12-year-old people at rigorous levels, and they were performing and blowing the lid off the roof. Miss Page 53, who was laughing at me in the teacher's lounge, two weeks later, this is her. Class, sit down, be quiet, don't do that, Johnny, stop. Okay, come on, y'all pick up this track. Ten, nine, eight, I'm waiting. The kids are waiting too. And guess what now, I'm on page 54, passing her because I bothered to build relationships. See, relational capacity is what can you do or say to a child solely based on your relationship. My little sister who's nodding here, are you married? She's married, okay. What if this morning your husband said to you, I love you, you're the most beautiful thing in the world, and I can't wait for you to get home tonight because I got a surprise for you. Would you have liked that? She said, yeah. <laughs> what if when you walked through this door this morning, I walked up to you and said, I love you, you're the most beautiful thing in the world, and I can't wait for you to get home tonight because I have a surprise for you. Would you have liked that? No. Wait a minute. Her husband and I have said the same exact words with the same exact inflection, with the same syntax, with the same punctuation, with the same voice tone. Why does she treat me differently? Relational capacity. There are certain things your husband can say to you, do with you, that I just can't. <laughs> Solely based on our relationship. What can I get you to do? And let me, let me say this. I don't have to say this to you. But you have kids. I had kids. I know you didn't. I had kids that, would, that never had a problem in my class that would sit in in-school suspension constantly. And I'd go to the kid and say, why are you in here? First thing out the kid's mouth, she don't like me. She's racist. <laughs> you know better. But as a former assistant principal, let me say this, not to y'all, but to the folks who aren't here. As assistant principal, I cannot fix a child when the problem is the relationship between you and a child. I can't do it. You ever had a kid go to in-school suspension and come back fixed? It won't happen. <laughs> because in-school suspension is a punishment. Punishment is not designed to change behavior. It never has been. 50% of the people in prison today, when they get out, will be back in three years. It's a punishment. It is not designed to change behavior. 80% of those people will be back. Relational capacity changes behavior. So we talk a lot about college readiness. I want to raise the rigor of all of your classes for all students, but also I want to engage every child in your classroom. That's why I love AVID. That's why I love the Wicker Strategies. Because it takes me as a teacher, and I'm no longer the sage on the stage. See, as a first-year teacher, I thought I had to be the sage on the stage. Once I became culturally relevant, and once I became an avid person, 
then I said, I need to be more of the guide on the side. Because as an evaluator of teachers, what I realized is the person in the room doing the most work is the person in the room doing the most learning. As a first year teacher, I was working hard and I knew my stuff. But see, as a sage on the stage, you're a deliverer of packages. And you give this power to the children. They get to decide, do I open the package? Will I sign for the package? Will I meet the UPS man at the door? So my question and my theme is, does all mean all? If we say all children should be ready for college, all children have, should have access and equity to your most rigorous courses, does all mean all? What is an acceptable level of casualties? As a first year teacher, kids who failed my class, well, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They got their F. As a second year teacher, once I built relational capacity and I understood how to teach children, there was no acceptable level of casualties. So college readiness, you know David Connolly, talks about what we need to do to make sure all of our kids are ready for college and they don't need remediation because we know for every 100 ninth graders, 70 will finish high school. Oh, and then 44 will enter college. 30 will then return for their sophomore year. 21 will get a bachelor's degree in six years. And as my colleague from the college board said yesterday, it's just, a, it's just an open faucet. And we're constantly losing kids. So college, in my state of Texas, you can see that we are not graduating our students at the rate we should. 56 of every 100 freshmen in my state will finish college in six years. We're sending more and more students to college but they're not ready and they have to start in remedial courses. Basic math, reading. Do you have to pay for those courses? You betcha. Oh, do they count towards the chemistry degree you want? That's why 91% of the kids that we send needing reading quit. You had sent me to Prayer View and say, slow your roll, you gotta take reading. I wouldn't be in front of you today. That's why I love AVID's mission. AVID's mission is to prepare all kids for college readiness and success in a global society. So as you go back to your different schools and different districts, think about what is your role in achieving the mission of AVID. Does all mean all? What is an acceptable level of casualties? Want to talk about equity? That's my baby. Equity? I want to raise the achievement of every kid you have, but at the same time, I want to narrow the gaps. I want to eliminate predictability. Let me tell on myself. Let me be open, honest, and vulnerable with you. Had you come to my school before AVID, and I ask you as my faculty, we haven't had one day of instruction. This is back to school staff development. Staff. What, what is the racial group that will do the worst on the state test this year? We could have put money on it and won predictability. Which group will be overrepresented in in-school suspension and special education? Before we've even seen a child, we could have put money on it and won. So with equity, I want to give kids a high predictability of success. How do I do that? We know two, two, two AP classes, two, will double a kid's chances of finishing college, not getting in, finishing college in four years or less. I finished Prairie View A&M University in less than four years. I am no genius. Great teachers like you gave me access and equity to the most rigorous courses. 
I can double and triple a child's chance of finishing college in four years or less by opening access. You can see here, five-year college completion rates. Let me, as a black boy, let me take the AP course. Even if I don't take the test, you have given me a 16% higher chance of finishing a, with a bachelor's degree in five or less years. And you can see for every racial group and for every income group, double-digit increase by access and equity to your most rigorous courses. And that's why I love AVID, because we are giving access and equity to our most rigorous courses, but we're providing that support system. Because equity is not equal. Never has been. If I want every kid to end in the same place, and I know they're not starting in the same place, what I do with 180 days of instruction makes the difference in the trajectory of the rest of a kid's life. So again, I ask you, does all mean all? What is an acceptable level of casualties. Once I, as a classroom teacher, said, no child will fail my class, then the responsibility was put on me. Because as a first year, I said, oh, of course he failed. He doesn't do this. He won't bring this. He won't bring a pencil. He won't pull up his pants. He won't take his hat off. Notice the pronoun, he, 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 he. I have nothing to do with that. Stephen, are you serious? Three minutes? <laughs> you know what? I have the microphone, <laughs> and you sitting down there. I'm going to keep going. Let's move. <laughs> Yank me off if you have to. <laughs> Culturally relevant teaching, and you hear a lot about that in our equity strands here at, here at the National Conference. I want to engage all kids, but I want to build upon their learning styles, their strengths, their experiences. We as educators have to get out of the deficit model. Talking about what he can't do or what he won't do or what his parents don't have, those are reasons why we allow kids to fail. Because kids who failed my class that first year, well, his mama's on crack, his daddy's in jail, he live with his big mama, he won't pull up his pants. See, all of those reasons I allowed him to fail. But once I became culturally relevant, I said, where do I get him? Where does he start? And I have 180 days because I don't want to pass him to the eighth grade teacher and then the eighth grade teacher spends the whole year, well, he can't do this and he won't do this and he can't do this. Where does the buck stop? And I decided as a second year teacher, in my classroom. I became culturally relevant. Linda Darling Hammond, she says, some of our children come to school every day and have their culture validated, but some of our kids come to school every day and have their culture invalidated even berated daily. Does culture matter? You better believe it. Yo quiero hablar con los sientes aquí que pueden hablar español. Solamente los estudiantes en este cuarto que pueden hablar español. Su son muy inteligentes. Los otros personas aquí, nah. <laughs> si tú pueden comprender Mis palabras, levántese tus manos muy alto y repiten, ¡Viva la raza! ¡Yo soy latino! Okay, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, <laughs> we're not plotting against you. Don't get nervous. <laughs> Does culture matter? Yeah. Think about how you felt if you didn't understand what I was saying and you saw Spanish-speaking people raising their hands and getting excited. You were so nervous or you were like, I'm lost. That happens in classrooms every day. You better go see Michelle Mullen after this. She's going to talk about that in her strength. Does culture matter? Does culture matter? If you know this song, stand up and sing it with me. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies 
of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Okay, for time's sake, we're going to stop there. <laughs> Did you notice the demographics of who got up? Don't worry the rest of y'all, we didn't, that's not a song of plotting. <laughs> that's the National Negro Anthem, the Negro National Anthem. If you didn't know that there was one, <laughs> we got some equity work to do. <laughs> Let's go here. How many of you can name all five characters from the situational comedy Friends? Uh-huh, look at the demographics of the hands up. <laughs> Okay, that was a number one comedy. I have never been able to sit through one episode. Because I was sitting up there watching it because I, I wanted to be in conversations with my, with my friends. And I watched it for 10 minutes and I say, do these people go to work? I mean, they sitting in a coffee shop and they talking, when, when, when do they go to work? I can't watch this. Does culture matter? Minnie Jean. We talk about the achievement gap. We talk about the Little Rock Nine. Look, the thing that scares me, those people in the background are still alive. They still walk in this earth. Minnie Jean. We talk about achievement gap. All nine of those babies went on to post-secondary. Most of them have master's degrees. All of the boys have either a master's or a doctorate. So what happens? Because now we look at what's going on now, what we call the achievement gap. I don't believe there's such a thing. We have opportunities we're missing. There's no achievement gap because that label is something that's put on people who look like me. I hate it. We have opportunities we're missing. And who teaches whom? Who has access to the most rigorous curriculum? If you look there, possible SAT scores, you can see me at the bottom. How do we get from Minnie Jean Brown and all of them going on to post-secondary to what we know as the achievement gap today. What am I looking at, Stephen? He said, I'm done. <laughs> OK. As I close, can I get the ushers to come on forward? <laughs> we going to open this altar. The reason why this is a crisis, you look up here, this is graduation from high school for black boys. The red states do not graduate half of their black boys from high school. The pink states where I live, we don't graduate over 70% of our black boys from high school. The light green states, you can see they're approaching 70%. The dark green states are the only ones in this country that graduate a majority of their black boys. So in North Dakota, both of them finished. <laughs> yes. All right, North Dakota. And when we look at the achievement gap, when we look at the achievement gap, <laughs> You can see, when you look at who's in prison, these boys are in prison. Doesn't it follow the same predictable, oh equity, predictable pattern? If you're white, you have a better chance of staying out of prison. You can see in all men, one in every 54. Hispanic men, one in every 36 is in prison. Black men, one in 15 are behind bars today. You can see if you're a black boy and you're from 20 to 34, one in nine chance. Y'all don't know how I went to praising God the day I turned 35. Because I say, I'm out of that statistic. But I'm still one in 15. What, what do I have, Stephen? I'm done. So let me leave you with this message. As you leave here today, the doors of the church are open. Does all mean all? Is there an acceptable level of casualties? As avid educators, you know there is, and I'm preaching to the choir up here. You know, as avid educators, there is no acceptable level of casualties. We happen to have America's best teacher. That's not my label. CNN gave that to her. Mary Catherine Swanson sitting up here. <laughs> who 31 years ago said, all means all. There is no acceptable level of casualties. I can see my uh, demo school I'm coaching back there. What percent, uh, O'Banion? Stand up, O'Banion. 
What, what percent of your kids, what percent of your eighth grade algebra one avid students passed the end of course exam? 100%. So anybody denying access and equity to Algebra 1 to some 8th graders, you better look at that table and say it can be done. Because what you're really saying to a 12-year-old, if you don't give access and equity and support, you're really saying you will never take calculus. You're not good enough for it. I have decided that for you while you're 11. Good luck. And I have played with the trajectory of the rest of a kid's life. Thank y'all so much. I'm going to sit down, Stephen. Thank you so much. I appreciate you.